I guess I'd be awkward too if my girlfriend just sent Datsu the helicopter. They set up that threat just to reinforce that Elisa is this really threatening killing machine, which means that the chopper is introduced and dealt with in the same cutscene. It's well animated and fun to watch, but the whole cutscene feels like a waste of time, especially when most of it made no f***ing sense. Usually, these cutscenes have Lars standing a few meters apart from another character, and just dumping dialogue with them, showing off their body language. They never interact in their scenes other than walking on the ground. There's very few moving parts and the landscapes feel particularly dead mostly being public areas. Take this cutscene with Li Chao Lan, he's the CEO and founder of Violet Systems. It'd be more interesting if he pulled you into a meeting room or an office or something, but instead he and Lars just kind of talk outside of his building. He's pretty much only after helping his own bottom line by offering Lars a hand, so he's at the very least a neutral force. He's also not G-Corp or the Mishima Zaibatsu, so that's good. This is the extent of the war we get to see in truly urban landscapes outside of the game's main stages. Like the urban war zone, where you duke it out on a bridge as tanks are fighting around you. There's a lot of things going on in the background here, and the music reflects a tense war zone with subdued dystopic synth to let a sick guitar solo push through. It's a testament to how routine this side is. There's a tunnel disaster in one of the stages with firefighters struggling to decide what to do in the background. The scene is so chaotic I don't know if the flooding from the rafters is a sprinkler system or because the tunnel is underwater and the current predicament is way larger than expected. There's a graveyard stage, which has a floor break with no coffins or bodies falling to the sewers below, which, while confusing at first, makes sense if there's no body left to bury. City After Dark is a grim, lurid, neon-lit cityscape. The giant sign to the background illuminate you until you punch each other into it, leaving the stage nothing but dark, rusted metals and squealings of trains overhead. And while the common man suffers through this, the rich live it up. High Rollers Club is bombastic and fun and garishly golden. Some class of people are clearly profiting from this war and enjoying money matches underground. The most revealing stage in this anti-war narrative, however, is Fallen Colony. It's the most beautiful stage in the game, maybe since Tekken 4. Anyone anime savvy will immediately recognize the inspiration and start praying for Australia. The space colony is falling into Earth's atmosphere, the artificial land crumbling and deforming, being eaten by clouds. A fighter jet blasts past you, distorting the screen space with their exhaust. The sun glares off misplaced solar panels. It's so colourful and the sky is such a deep blue. The music here is incredible. It's this bizarre, whiplash-inducing song that seems to take inspiration from grunge rock, hair metal, rap, brass band orchestra, choir. There's more than I can even pick out. It's an extensive list of music genres that generally are American music. It's a mixing pot, if you will. The colony is modeled after America. You're fighting in front of, and on a portion of, the White House. The ground beneath it falters. America is Britain's greatest colony, which has broke off into an independent state, or collection of states, but here is depicted as having fallen. What's fell the colony is clearly a war. It's revealing the metaphorical artificiality of America. This in itself is a pretty clear-cut metaphor, but when you floor-break the stage, it reveals a lonely office, overgrown by trees. This doesn't happen during a war outbreak. It represents some kind of abandonment, decadence, rot. A lack of care in maintaining what the stage is built upon. A removed portion of the wall reveals the fighter jet dancing in the sky above slash below the colony. The window behind you looks to what's soon going to become a horizon. And yet, even as this colony falls, there's still two people fighting. You're still going to fight, even though in this scenario doom is inevitable. These stages in Tekken 6 really don't get much love from the Tekken community, but they're incredible. They're actually great. They're better than most Tekken 5 stages. A true technical showcase as well. Most of them emphasize lighting techniques like bloom, casting, sheen textures to really try and ground characters in the environment convincingly. Mystic Forest is dense with foliage and has a jazzy jig behind it. It's unrelentingly green and is a calming contrast compared to everything else. Yinshi Valley is an untouched, seemingly infinite blanket of snow that gets torn up beneath your feet which is a loving amount of detail, some real traditional electronic effusion for this soundtrack. Temple Grounds is visually stunning with its rapid day-night transitions, deeply transforming the visual effects rendered between bloom and lighting on the Central Asian structures, truly an incredible display of the new console generation's power. This vague architecture could be seen to be Vietnamese, and this game scenario is a war. It's a concern to me that the stage's song takes the drumline from Spitfire by the Prodigy. I wouldn't want to associate those things myself. Rustic Area is clearly influenced on rural China. It opens with a man crashing his car through the background to scatter his livestock all over the stage. Is that Forest Law driving that truck? Jin's martial law is impacting martial law's restaurant business, and more importantly his son had an accident, which only compounds his debts. For his own story, he enlists the similarly indebted Paul and Steve, who no longer has anything to do, to help Ray Guy in Fist 6. 
I gotta give it up for this, the joke endings are structured into a larger joke. Paul's ending depicts him winning the tournament by destroying Paul's remaining brain cells and any chance of Forrest having a brother. Wacky. Then Law's ending, he gives the other two laxatives to steal the money for himself, which implies something horrifying about his debts. How silly. And finally, Steve, who doesn't actually care about the money, wanders off as the Tekken Force fucking kill Law and Paul in cold blood to the main theme from Men in Black. Steve himself inhabits the campaign by fighting in underground rings to develop his boxing prowess, unlikely to get by financially. King and Marduk occupy a similar role, owning an MMA ring underground. Their story mode is joint in their search to understand why Armor King is alive again. Marduk starts by confirming that Armor King's body is indeed in its grave by digging him up. The guy behind him is not going to be happy, but that guy also happens to be Armor King. Now how could that be? Back at King's home, he looks at his meager showcase. It's unceremoniously decorated with his trophies and photo highlights of his career, Marduk, and his old master, Armor King. This is the funniest thing that has ever happened in Tekken. <laughs> anyway, later, King interjects at the graveyard with his newfound knowledge. They're both Armor King. Despite how stupid this storyline has gotten, he's fighting to avenge his lost brother against the, against the murderer and the man who has sided with the murderer. As for the new characters introduced in the intro, their initial characterizations don't go anywhere yet. Leo is addressed a letter. Miguel fails to reach Jin. Bob is no longer fat, completing his joke. But these characters weren't introduced to have their own stories, really. There's a running theme developing here, even among the most joke characters this time. Everyone's involved in this web of revenge for lost or injured loved ones. Armor King's headshot brother, Asuka's hospitalized father, Lily's bankrupt father, Marshall Law's injured son, Miguel's late sister, Christy and Eddie's terminal master, Wang's fallen friend, Yoshimitsu's lost clan, Jin's vanished mother, Xiaoyu's demented love, Kuma's hidden master, etc. Most of the cast is fighting because they're afraid of losing a loved one, or they're wholeheartedly avenging them. This will run into a larger and more meaningful theme, as the main villain develops a larger role in the plot. Speaking of, it's time to actually put the pressure against Jin and Kazuya. There's a lot done to establish how much Lars feels for his unit again, and how it makes him feel to be at home with them again. Elisa makes a telling quip, which is liberally localized. She says, better translated, having a place to return is happiness. My father said that long ago. Lars responds by letting the word father linger on his lips. It's a brief reminder of his relation before we go meet Kazuya. The breach into G Corp doesn't really make sense, but whatever, we gotta see both sides. We take down Eddie, Bruce is also here, and his joke ending is that he's a bad character. But his stage has these balconies that you or Elisa can just clip off of if you're not careful and fall into the Ace Combat 6 jet models. Elisa as a character is really well suited to fighting several characters at once. She has strong follow through with her attacks which keeps her out of harm's way. She really controls a room. She's just far better to play as than Lars for the entirety of your playthrough, especially with the rocket punches, even though this will introduce inconsistencies to some situations in the story where they split up. Despite how her AI apparently develops as you complete stages, implying emotional growth in the fledgling humanoid, here she's just going to commit suicide. It's a charming addition that endears you anyway, the AI growth thing. I'll say it, instant death pits are one of the biggest mistakes in video games. If you disagree with me, you can fight me IRL, preferably over a bottomless pit so I have a 50-50 shot of winning. Finally, we bust into the G-Corp head offices, hosted at the Millennium Tower, a conceptual building Tokyo never got around to making in real life. And because the game's difficulty is about to hike up harshly as we enter the final gauntlet of missions, we have some levity. Elisa writes in a journal she pilfered the keys to Nancy MI-847J, an indomitable robot that's an extra battle in arcade mode. I've never personally beat it, since you only get one shot and it just throws you in front of Jin afterwards anyway. It's time to get a feel for the clunker. It looks like it came out of death by degrees and it handles like a fax machine, but it can because its gun arms mow down swaths of twats from afar. This isn't so much a stage as it is a leisurely stroll, especially with the second health bar. This thing was obviously on the cutting room floor until the last minute. It really feels like it's not meant to be played. The absurdity of it plays into an absurdist entertainment value. This thing is so OP. These things are truly iron fists. It makes you understand power is everything. And who do you think the boss of this stage is? Who do you think Haruda personally gifted to me as a target as he handed me the keys of this military grade blender? Costume design so cougar -esque you can smell the laid perfume over the dried cum. The last time I complained about it, I got a viewer drop off so substantial it tanked the rest of my Tekken 5 videos. Is it perchance Anna Williams? The Anna Williams? Yes, it is! <laughs> yes! 
I always get what I want! <laughs> nah, she just appears in a cutscene afterwards. Of course she can live through that, she's taken bigger. This is her opportunity to actually play a role in the story, when all she does is treat trained soldiers like stripper poles while the world is in fucking flames. There's a nice moment where Lars puts himself in the line of fire, sheltering a robot that can take artillery. Which is stupid, but it tells us about the characters and how close they've gotten. Togo and the boys arrive just in time. A little worn from their battle up to this point, bloodied. They provide Lars with cover so that he can finally finish the cow off. Ah, and Kazuya too. Upon his Millennium Tower helipad, any character you select will quip that Kazuya sees himself as a hero now, and he'll exclaim something to the effect the world has chosen him. As mentioned at the start, G Corp are seen as the good guys by the public eye in this war, despite being just as much participating in this war as anyone else. I'd like to make it clear, Kazuya is not a hero, he's the devil incarnate. He's done countless terrible things, including here, where his acts have been to further incite the war. The attacks he's shown performing in the opening are evidence of this, be they against oil rigs or causing public pandemonium hunting down Jin. Simply because he's fighting another evil, he's a hero. Never mind that he's attempted to kill his father or any of the other crimes he's committed. Kazuya, despite being one of the primary antagonists, breaks the ongoing convention of characters seeking revenge for lost loved ones, and is instead looking for power himself. Defeating Jin is just another method for him to take over the world. But Kazuya and Lars are effectively similar characters. The descendants from Heihachi is to link them formally as self-made renegade heroes. When Lars reawakened to his memories, he immediately shot Heihachi in the face. This is a clumsily laid point in the story, because Lars isn't really as bad as Kazuya in intention or even in actions. Kazuya took over Hokkaido, abducted endangered animal species like dinosaurs, to add to an army. But attempted patricide is a sin they both share. Fortunately, they make sure to follow up immediately with an example of how Lars differs greatly from his manlet sibling, in his respect for human life. We return to what was Lars' team, decimated. Togo leans against a vehicle spent, the only survivor of the skirmish. And not for long either, he's fatally wounded. Despite Togo being upstaged by every other character in cutscenes and receiving the minimal amount of screen time necessary to even remember him, he gets a shockingly touching death scene, with some absolutely beautiful music. He's treated as more of a narrative tool than as a proper character, sadly, because he's designed to represent the consequences of this war for those who fight at sides. Having a place to return is happiness, said Dr. Bosconovich, and Lars no longer has a place to return. After the mission, Elisa makes a note in a journal that she should respect Lars's personal space in this situation. It's one of the few times they don't play up her inhumanity. From here, the plot's going to be advancing at a rapid rate, probably because we found a train that goes directly to the Mishima Zaibatsu from G Corp. Why didn't we do this before? Why haven't G Corp used this to attack? Why is Nina on this train? Bye, Nina. Nancy gets to make an appearance in a follow-up cutscene so that Raven can establish himself as an ally of some kind, now that Lars and Elisa are effectively alone. If anything more meaningful than that happened, I'd have an excuse to show you this exquisite and bizarre fight scene where Raven lets us advance to the Mishima HQ. Now it's just you and me, baby. It's time to ice skate uphill to Jin's lair, with more subtle foreboding. Hey, Nina, you're late. You have a train to catch. Nina and Anna's endings are embarrassingly bad, yet again. They're not even entertaining except the classy jazz. They bring up an issue generally with the directing of the endings. They look like they were storyboarded as manga and directed as budget anime but they're in full, expensive-looking CG. This is always somewhat true. If I showed you Tekken 5's endings, you can almost see how the scene was probably drawn on paper, but never has the concept of motion been so intentionally poorly conveyed. The difference between these and in-game cutscenes is insane. We reach the top floor, which takes place in Jin's real-game boss stage, Gargoyle's Perch, and there's some things to make note of here. It's a circular cathedral motif, almost taken from Castlevania-styled vampiric imagery. Jin's throne overlooks a city covered in hellfire and storms, fogged in red smoke, the occasional mushroom cloud devouring the land. Within, the most prominent statue is of his devil form hand, grasping a globe like a plaything. Jin's not only aware of what his plan is wreaking, he's entirely remorseless about it. His purpose is larger than what he's doing here. Where well, the game had been designed around novelty before, which kept stages interesting and situations unique as it guided you through the dystopic world, previously this had been a wacky tour. However, here is the point at which the difficulty becomes prohibitively harsh, by scenario design and overpowering bosses. Health bars are excessively long for a beat-em-up, and Elisa, despite being this powerhouse man-blender, can't cope with the intermittent fire from well-placed gunner enemies. Jin himself? So, we established that Bound can temporarily keep juggled enemies closer and lower for one instance during a juggle. They removed the one instance limiter for that. Look at my health bar. This is why you need Elisa, she's got your back interrupting Jin when he's breaking all the rules of the game. 
アリサ限定モード解除。She was built in Mishima Lab with Mishima Money under Jin's command. The foreshadowing was everywhere. All of the flavor text and AI leveling was to give you a feeling of connection with the dainty droid. Even Jin is asking Lars, "Are you really that stupid?" All this time, she's been unintentionally feeding everything you've done to Jin. Lars says what any protagonist would say in this situation: "You planned this from the beginning." And you know what? It wasn't even a part of Jin's mythical plan. This was unintentional. It just happened to work out for him. You've been outright fighting everyone within the prefecture of not Japan, and joining in with this warring will awaken Azazel. What a self-made hero, using evil to justify using evil means, when really you were unintentionally dancing to Jin's whim. He didn't even care if you did. And Elisa? Most characters of the game have been fighting for lost and injured loved ones. That's the metaphor of her entire character. She was created to embody that thought. She's a killing machine fashioned after a dead child. She is what you create when you lower yourself to take vengeance for a loved one. A cartoonish bastardization of their memory, only bringing more sorrow to the world. Jin just walks away because he's got better things to do, leaving you to play with a toy he doesn't even really want in the hardest fight of the game. Her move set is insane. Key charging gives her low crush, invincibility, and stun frames. Usual strings she has get looped, so she can back you into a wall. Though this string is punishable. Randomly, being hit won't be the bad part. Bosses have started to develop the ability to occasionally freeze you, setting you up for whatever their whimsical AI feels would be a decent follow-up. Her ads, more than attacking you, get in the way of the damn camera when you fight her. She fires rocket punches from the other end of the stage while you try to fight these ads off camera, and playing generally defensively will have the stage timer run out, resulting in your loss. This fight is the hardest in the game, and it makes sense because this is an emotional low point. After the fight, it seems for a moment Elisa is back, but it's just to give us hope. She fends Lars off before retreating, having Lars collect the wreath she keeps on her head. What's the holdup? Oh, apparently Raven is our partner for all the remaining missions. I think that's the only reason he helped before, so that this didn't feel out of nowhere. His entire character is in his mysterious allegiance, but it's so mysterious I don't care. He impacts nothing. He just stands around from the shadows, watching other people actually do shit. And he won't take the opportunity as a sidekick here to have any character either. We tag along with the Ebony Shinobi to the Middle Eastern section of Japan near Tokyo. The thin veil that this is all set in Japan is pretty much a parody of itself at this point, point. and something tells me it was to give plausible deniability to the developers about what's about to be depicted. Civilians are stumbling and cowering as their totally not Middle Eastern villages burn at the hands of the Tekken Force. The residents are being shot at, and they're forced to take up arms to defend themselves. Does this remind you of anything? Anything that will date this game harder than the PlayStation home furniture you unlock during cutscenes? Tekken 6's war and revenge narrative are all a part of a commentary on 9/11 and America's global war on terror. The Mishima Zaibatsu owns the UN because America owns the UN. G Corp and Tekken Force take over oil fields and rigs because that's a common theory as to America's true motivations for its Middle Eastern wars. The resulting actions of the Tekken Force destroying the Middle East rips imagery directly from the contemporary wars. Islamic extremists declared war on the developed world as they destroyed its trade centers, and America viewed themselves as heroic by placing themselves in opposition. This is paralleled in how Lars and Kazuya see themselves compared to Jin. Fallen Colony is the White House because America was seething and corrupted from its hatred. America fought a monster and became a monster itself. High Rollers Club shows people who have more money than sense still existing in this world torn apart, enjoying a good fight. The war Jin wages may be causing natural disasters as Azazel stirs beneath the earth, and this is a metaphor that's built on as we get close to Jin. This is close to where Azazel's temple is for the longest mission in the game. Thankfully, since the Elisa stage, there are now checkpoints for these longer stretches that feel hastily placed. Anyway, that's literally everything Zafina does in this plot. She's a footnote of a footnote, used only to push forward the prophecy that the story functions around: that Azazel shall awaken and show his wrath to humanity when there's enough unpleasantness, violence, and hatred in the world. And Jin's plan seems to be to stir him awake based on a tablet kept in the Mishima Zaibatsu, a plot point that's only important for the procedural elements of the story. On our way through the temple, we meet Kazuya to remind us one more time who Lars is paralleling. Apparently, Kazuya hadn't quite cottoned on last time that they were brothers, and he could only tell once he did that cross-counter thing he does with people. 
The interesting part of this cutscene is that Kazuya really takes this shit in stride. Lars tries to arrest him, but he just walks away while that skag throws a flashbang. Of course, Lars once again chooses the thing the protagonist would say, but it's wearing a bit thin. I don't think anyone believes him. I don't know why Kazuya would stop just before Azazel's chamber, but he does. I think he walks out to fight Jin in front of the temple in Jin's ending, which is a lot of nothing. Hey, that sounds like boss music. Thanks, Keiichi Okabe. The weird Egyptian-looking fleshy beaked beast claims he's the rectifier of all things, which is a peculiar claim when the name Azazel is found in the Old Testament, a name given to either a sacrificial lamb or to whom sacrificial lambs went to. They're animals that take the sins of men that are ritually killed in order to cleanse us. I guess Christ either isn't canonical or wasn't good enough for the Tekken universe because this motherfucker is jacked on the sins of mankind. No, he's nancied on him. So much so that he's causing natural disasters, somehow. He's taken the role upon himself that he shall make the world atone rather than taking them onto himself. Lars claims he's just another monster with a god complex. But of all people, Brian Fury has the quote of the game. Reasons and motives are just afterthoughts. It's fighting that keeps us monsters alive. Who the fuck gave Brian a good line? Brian's character for this game is just how utterly bored of fighting he is. It's gotten old to him, and he looked at the tournament as a chance to have fun, and what Brian says is true. When you lose, the continue screen, which once put pressure on the player with a pulsating beat in most games, is now sorrowful with a soothing guitar melody. This is the theme of letting it set in, because if Miguel doesn't continue, he has to accept his sister's death. If Armor King doesn't continue, he has to accept that his brother's dead, and that the world might continue to revolve without him. Either way, he's right to be dismissive because Azazel ultimately doesn't play much of a role in this story other than for his symbolism. Lars just spouts those protagonistic one-liners that sound brave and just, like proclaiming he'll never let a monster decide his future. But Azazel rather disappointedly responds that Lars is just an example of humanity's folly. This will become more apparent as we go on from here. There's a collection of endings where characters defeat Azazel, like Wang and Bake, but they live to collect the creature's black orble heart. Dragonov and Raven waste this on some Nina Anna feudal shit. Harang has a crisis of character where he considers momentarily that he could wield the same powers as Devil Jin, which he turns his back on. Devil Jin himself has his power taken away by the orb, which leads to Zafina's ending where she collapses the temple. Ganryu is the only man evil enough to truly allow the power to go through him, but he's too fat to fly. This is a reference to an unreleased and unannounced modification of Tekken Tag Tournament 1, where the gameplay was twice as fast and Ganryu had devil powers. There's a neat little collapsing temple section now that Azazel's defeated, where pillars fall behind you as you run toward the camera, before the camera comes out of some fat dude's ass and you have to burn him alive. Jin looks rather impatient at this point, and very unamused. He's just having fun at this point coaxing Lars to attack before Elisa autopilots in on defense. Elisa's role in this story will fully develop here as well, as you have to defeat her. This rerun is in a more open space and ultimately isn't as difficult as the first attempt, because your shinobi homie's got you back. Except that she can fucking heal now when she taunts. Jin's activation of her defense circuits is represented by changing her eyes red. And that's not the only thing of note here. Her iris develops into the shape of a lamb's. She is going to be sacrificed at Lars's hands. After you defeat her, the programming clears up, and she lies on her last legs. Seems Lars placed the flowers from her head at her side. She offers meek apology for things she couldn't control, like her reason for being created, but reassures Lars that their time spent together was wonderful, and regrets it couldn't last longer, because Lars actually treated her like a person. This line has sadder implications on inspection. Jin and the lab staff may have treated her as a tool, but Baskonovich was recreating his daughter. To be treated like a replacement for another person mustn't be too dissimilar a feeling from being treated as a weapon. To be depersonalized into a role, rather than allowed to be yourself. Lars clearly feels her pain as his own. Dude, Jin, we're trying to have a moment here, okay? Lars is so offended, so deeply, bitterly offended. Some of the most biting disses in Tekken are being spat right here and now at a man who just watched his sex doll run out of batteries. It's like Jin's trying to upset Lars.
And the fight's rough. Plenty of ads, Raven sucks, Jin can wave dash in from across the stage, he can juggle you with strung electrics without giving a shit. There's not much more to say about these fights, sadly, because there isn't even music for the final boss. It's not really worth mentioning, because Lars changes nothing. He just plays into Jin's hand. The Abyss gazing back into you is a quote that encapsulates almost all of these personal vengeances. Jin reveals how exactly his plan was enacted. As a holder of the Devil Gene, he heard Azazel speak to him, that he would be resurrected if he filled the world with enough negative energy. And it worked. He says it's just the Devil Gene at work. Lars is astonished that Jin thinks this is in any way a decent excuse. The assumption was that resurrecting Azazel and defeating him would save the world, but Jin never said this himself. His true plan was to commit suicide in defeating Azazel, a symbol to him of the Devil Gene, treating him as a sacrifice for all the world's sins poetically. Jin doesn't even think he's saving the world. He doesn't think he can. He doesn't think it's worth saving. The ruling classes are just as worthless as the people who cower under them. Who could possibly save such a twisted world? What the hell happened to that young boy that just wanted to be with his mother again? It's a direct challenge to Lars, who's been pretending to be the role of the hero all the way through the game. He thinks he's defeated the villain, he thinks he's won. But Azazel's already back, here for Jin's plan. One runs to the other, and they disappear down a hall to have a true final boss fight without you. Without the protagonist. To finish off the parallels to the global war on terror, Jin set about a world war because he wanted vengeance for his mother paralleling America's actions in the wake of 9-11. The global war on terror ended up causing more terror than it was fighting, which is the play they make by representing humanity's sins with Azazel. There is no even sum, the world just continues to fall down a darker path. As Brian said, to monsters, anything is just post hoc reasoning to give in to their worst traits. And he who fights monsters should be careful not to become a monster himself. The game's final warning was that we're using our fallen loved ones as an excuse to sin, thinking any action in vengeance might be justified, an eye for an eye. But what we're doing corrupts their memory. Who they were in life is replaced by nothing but anger. The real way to remember those past is to just let go of the hatred and mourn them. Let the timer run down, go home. Learn to deal with the situation you're in, rather than deny it in anger. If anyone here had done that, maybe Jin's plan wouldn't have worked. Lars is just left to stare on at this, and... And Nina Williams. Who keeps inviting you? Yes, but what's done is done. Jin. Jin put everything he had into this one moment. It's not for me to judge if he was right or wrong. Maybe you're such a saint. You think you can. But somehow, I doubt it. What the fuck are you talking about? This man brought the world to the brink of ruin and you're gonna stand there like, yeah, well look at yourself, mate. Yeah, I get that. I get what they wanted to say here. Lars' actions also attributed to this moment. He isn't a hero. But we're comparing this loser who can't change anything to a man content with human genocide because he misses his mummy. Fuck you, Nina. Go pay Steve's child support. Apologize to me for death by degrees. You think you can get away with that line after years of shit joke endings? I really hope Marduk finds you. Lars and Raven share a really awkward car ride out of the desert. Elisa gets given to Lee to see if they can reactivate her. Raven passes back the insignia Togo found at the beginning, reminding Lars that he's not alone. He still has the memory of his unit with him. Maybe he'll keep them in his heart in a way that isn't with hatred this time. And that's the end. In the next game, we discover Jin didn't even die. The Devil Gene still exists. And in its DLC, that Azazel wasn't even defeated. All of this was for absolutely nothing.